then as long as he isn't, as long as Pharaoh think it's me and it's I am the powerful one and I'm, then we have a problem. And when, and the whole dynamics in our life, you know, the whole dynamics described in, in Exodus is how uh, Pharaoh, against his will, has to be brought to his knees and mm. do, do God's bidding. Mm. And he's, the question is, how is it happening in me? I love that. I mean, I just think that's so, because then it's, you know, no one is the outs, you know, we're, we're all, it, we're all, all of it, you know, like it, yeah. it, it lives in us. Yeah. I would like to add one more thing. And again, I, that's why it was the warning about the mystic. The only way that Pharaoh comes to his knees is through colossal failure. Mm. And through, lo and behold, through pandemics, through diseases, mm. he's brought to his knees to realize, wait a minute, something that I'm doing is not right. Mm. As you said, we thought, oh, the summer came, let's go back to, let's go back to normal. But normal is what the problem was. Mm. And there is an invitation to be super normal. There is an invitation here to actually start listening with different ears. Mm -hmm. There is an invitation is to question what is our notion of ourselves? How do we understand ourselves? What is our notion of our relationship to the universe? And what is standing between me and having that different relationship? What is standing between me and having uh, this conviction of me being a pharaoh or aspiring pharaoh or a failed pharaoh? And what stands between me and starting to respect that part of me, which is Moses. And you know, the, the time we are in, where we said, talk about something, we say it's shrouded in mysticism. Mm -hmm. That is so revealing because mystics used to be the nuclear physics of their time. They were the ones who were going to unknown chart, uncharted territories. And they were actually the one that provided the the backbone for spiritual teachings to, to develop. Of course, there's, there's all kinds of good reasons for it, but now mysticism, oh, he's just a mystic. He's talking mysticism. And we live in an age I feel something has to be changed so that not that we go back to any less evolved era, but can our consciousness acknowledge as C.G. Jung uh, encouraged us to do that at the basis of the intellectual development, we are mythological creatures. And there is a collective unconscious where with a lot of information about who we are and that we have to start learning from there, not just from New York Times and Washington Post and what have you. Wow, it's, that's a lot to chew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'm so with you um, as a fellow lover and mystic. I, I, um, I think what I want to pull out from that, I think I'm getting off the page because you've just opened this up for us. So I, I'm going to move away from my, I'll use some of those questions in a bit, but um, I want to stay here. Um, I guess what I want to ask you is, um, you know, in reawakening that sense of myth um, and reawakening the, um, what I often think is this magical world that is teeming with life that we so often don't see because we are, we are shrouded mm -hmm. um, and we have to take off those clipo, those shells that keep us from experiencing the beauty and the magic of this world. I told you this story when we spoke and I'll just, I'm gonna make it very short cause I wanna hear you. Um, but when I, this summer, my family and I spent um, a month away from Washington and we, I went on daily runs and on these runs, I was seeing owls. And my understanding is owls are nocturnal. So I just was, delighted. I would just sit and watch them. They were high up in the trees and they would watch me back. 
And I kept thinking to myself, there's a message. There's something that nature is speaking to me. And I don't know yet what it is, but was so delighted to be in that conversation with the natural world. And I feel like that practice is, it feels to me that that's what you're describing is this practice of both being aware of what's internally going on for us inside as ignited by the stories in our tradition and also using the the wisdom of the mystics to help us become aware and attuned to the natural world that is already here. And I just wondered if you'd say more about that attunement and how we get on that road. (laughs) Beautiful. So first of all, uh, I want to emphasize that that it's not that the intellectual and scientific development are wrong. And, you know, just like (laughs) Mark Twain, supposedly, apparently it may not have been him, but supposedly Mark Twain says, when I was 15, my father was a damn fool. When I was 25, I was amazed to realize how much the old man has learned in 10 years. Mm. Mm. So I feel that that kind of relationship is the relationship that science has to the old mystical traditions that in order to emerge, it had to just put it all aside and rebel and and separate and individuate, so to speak, and then come back and realize, wait a minute, now let's go back and look and let's see that there is different ways of relating to reality, as you say, that when an owl appears or when the sun sets, there's, the, depending on the situation, there may be something that we can connect to in a way that's not materialistic. And, and one of the things that would be interesting to find out is what stands between us and the ability to do that. Hmm. And that's, that's another thing that we need to talk about. And that's, that's why we wanted to talk about trauma. We wanted to talk about, about spiritual practice. But Basically, there are different ways, and sometimes many of us in our childhood, and maybe later in life, we get glimpses. But because there's no social, cultural context to understand those glimpses, we we let it slide, and there's no traction. And one of the things that happens in times of calamities in times of uncertainty, as you must experience as a rabbi, people turn to that which normally they scoff at, and they say, well, maybe there is something there, because that which, that which they base their pharaohic consciousness doesn't work. So they say, well, let me listen to the Moses in me a little bit more. And so I feel in that sense also that when that happens, then people live more in harmony with nature, then we will also violate nature less. And if we violate nature less, nature will not be not have to be so angry at us. You know, um, a few years ago, I, 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 I listened, I went and actually participated in, in, a, in a workshop that uh, famous spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle gave. And there's only one thing of that uh, workshop that I remember where he spoke about the earth. And he says, the earth is a living organism. And it's not just a rock floating in space. It's a system, a living organism. And he said, living organism has a way of purifying itself. So just like a human being, you know, it can, can take some abuse and some abuse. And afterwards, it, there comes a point where the sickness emerges. And sickness is just the body's attempt to purify itself from the disease. So he says, listen, either we wake up or the earth will start to purify itself because it's a living organism. Hmm. And when it purifies itself, Let's hope we're not found to be the cause of the disease, but the earth will go on. We may not. And so the invitation is also really to, to, to look into ourselves and see how, what is it that prevents us from living life of Moses, living life of 
of humility, of attachment to the to the mysteries of nature. You know, I mean, Moses' career starts when he sees a phenomena that he he's so at odd with. You know, he walks in the desert and he sees a burning bush, and the bush is not consumed. And I was thinking to myself, what would happen if today somebody saw it? They'd pull up the iPhone and pull it and put it on the on the Facebook. See how many likes they get. That's right. But that's not what Moses does. You know, in the story he goes, he says, "This is extraordinary. I bow down to this. What happens here?" And that can we develop? Can we first of all acknowledge that we lost, to a great extent, that relationship to nature? And can we find out, explore, what is it that can realign us? And with your permission, I'll say one more thing in this re regard. We are a very tiny planet, a planet chick, if you, if you want to say, just a tiny little speck in this universe. If you compare the size of the planet to, the, to the, what we believe to be the size of the universe, we're much tinier than a virus. We're, we're nothing. And it's on fire. Do we think that the intelligence that, that runs this whole universe, if we find a way of harnessing it and aligning ourselves with it, could handle this little planet? Is it possible that it could? just the off chance. And it reminds me of a story from the Talmud that Abraham walks somewhere and he sees a burning castle, Birad Oleket. And he asks, what is this? This burning castle is a metaphor for, for, our, for our world right now. And he says, is there somebody in charge of this? What's going on? And there's a voice that says, yes, there is somebody in charge. And then he can relax. Because if there's somebody in charge, there's a logic to it. And there is a way out of it. And not that I am attempting in any way to suggest that I understand the logic that anybody can. We are totally unprepared, as we said. And we need to allow ourselves to be surprised and to not know. But the fact that there is intuitive feeling that we can connect to, that there is somebody in charge, not somebody, some intelligence, and that intelligence is all pervasive. And then that gives us a kind of a direction in which to go. Mm, beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, so I'm going to return to the page, and I want to <laughs> ask if, um, if Igal, if you can define trauma. It's such a, it's such a big word for many of us. Many of us think when we think of trauma, um, of, you know, a, a war or a terrible famine. Um, and I wonder if that's the right way to think about it, or if it's more expansive than that and sort of giving us a little bit of the, also the, the symptoms that come along with it when we experience traumas, what happens to the mind body connection. Beautiful question. And that <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to those for whom the conversation that we had up to this point seems like it's a jump to suddenly talk about trauma. I want to say, no, it's completely in line because if we ask ourselves what stands in the way of us uh, readjusting our sense of self, one of the main things about it is trauma. So the way I understand trauma and I'm, you have contact with people who are much greater expert than mine in this field. Uh, trauma is not what happens to you. We think of trauma, yeah, wow, something happened. On one hand, some big thing. On the other hand, it's also been thrown around a lot these days. Like I stood in line for hours in the post office. It was such a traumatic experience. It's kind of also, there's a kind of inflation of the use. Trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is how the body responds to any overload. And the overload can be also positive, like, like 
something that feels overwhelming, like, or it can be, it often is negative. And one person's trauma is another person's difficult situation. Hmm. So anything that causes an overload in your system will be something that you will have to freeze in some way, to block in some way. So yes, uh, uh, about 30 years ago, finally PTSD was recognized as a, an official diagnosis. And that was important because a lot of soldiers started coming back and people needed how to, how to need to know how to deal with them. And then they saw that in case of rape, in case of, of uh, car accident, any event that causes like what's called shock trauma. Now that was one kind of trauma. And, and luckily there's a lot of knowledge that has accumulated in this kind of trauma. But there's another a much more insidious kind of trauma that you can talk about. And that's trauma that comes when you grow up in a family where the caregivers, not because they're bad people, but are not, not capable of attending to your emotional and or spiritual and or intellectual and or physical needs. And it could be sometimes because your mother was hospitalized for two months, God forbid, when you were two years old and, and, and your care was disrupted. So that's a different kind of trauma. It's more insidious because with this kind of trauma, we, we, it's not obvious. The, 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 the process is not obvious, manifests a lot later, but in both cases, what happens if the experience is too much and there's no way of regulate it, you freeze it somewhere in your body mm. and, and you don't address it, which is a very, we think about it as a bad thing that happens, but it's a very clever, useful mechanism. So for example, they say uh, that women during rape, they can dissociate with their body. And so that allows them to, to maintain some semblance of sanity in, in the face of that assault. But that dissociation breaks something of the mind-body coordination. So trauma is all those pockets of a frozen experience. Now, it depends when that experience happens and what the nature of that experience, how the symptoms will look. So these are individual traumas. I'd like to say that they've found out that trauma is passed over genetically or, or, or epigenetically from generation to the next. So for example, I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. The second generation Holocaust survivor syndrome is very similar across uh, all over. And Rachel Yehuda was the first one who broke that uh, who started, who started studying this and showing also with research that she did with mice that intergenerational trauma is passed on. Mm. As, a, as a side note, I will say that the symptoms of second generation Holocaust survivors, the symptoms of their trauma are almost identical wow. to the symptoms of second generation Holocaust perpetrators. Wow. So it's a, it's a very similar, and that, that is uh, something very surprising. So, so that's another kind of trauma. And then there's a third kind of trauma. And I'm sure there's more. I mean, this is what the knowledge that I have. And that is uh, um, cultural trauma, collective trauma. So for example, uh, one of the, uh, my teachers, uh, the person I study with is uh, Dr. Lawrence Heller. He's the person who uh, founded this uh, uh, system of, of um, trauma healing that I practice called NARM. And uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, yes, and he is fond of quoting a, 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 one of St. Paul's saying, now we see through the glass darkly, 
Hmm. And then we will see, right? Now, the thing is, when everybody sees through the glass darkly, then everybody thinks that that's normal. We live in a collective traumatized milieu. So certain things are not considered normal. So when kids have certain experiences of seeing things more deeply, they're being dismissed. And so they say, okay, that's not the way to get love. I have to get to, to tune in with, with, with what's happening. So these are kind of uh, just on a, a smattering, kind of like an, an, an idea of, 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 what's out uh, there. of what's up there about trauma. You know, when we spoke, um, when, we, when you and I spoke, um, you brought up this beautiful metaphor of the Kotzer Ruach, which mm-hmm. when I think about it, doesn't feel like a metaphor at all. It's this, you know, the idea of thinking about collective trauma and B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, almost, you know, losing their breath and having shortness of breath because they were, it seems to me, you know, this, you know, disembodied. It was having experienced what they experienced, both the, as you described trauma, you know, the overwhelming nature of the plagues and then the overwhelming nature of crossing the sea. Um, so both, it seems to me, both the, the miraculous and, and the incredible as well as the, the, this deeply sad and painful. And it seems like it literally caused the shortness of breath, which I actually have to say, the fact that the Torah has any concept of that, I always, like, those are the moments when I feel like there was divine inspiration here because Mm -hmm. to have awareness that those experience might cause you know, a lack of being connected to our bodies that we couldn't even breathe. It, it's mm-hmm. brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think I, I go back to what I said, that I look at that whole, uh, the, the whole story of the Exodus as, as basically as, as symbolic metaphors for what has happened in us, what's, what was happening in us. And the place where the shortage of bread was, was used is, when the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt and the result of Moses' negotiation with Pharaoh, he actually, that he asked them to let, he asked for them to be let go. Then Pharaoh increased their suffering, increased their work. And Moses started going to the people of Israel telling them, guys, God's going to help you. (laughs) Listen to the word of God. And it says, they wouldn't listen to him because of shortness of breath and for hard work. And I feel this is really telling of our times right now. We are so overwhelmed with what's happening right now. We are so overwhelmed. And, 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 and listen, I'm not criticizing every, anybody. This is overwhelming. I mean, if you... We don't have young children. If we had young children, two, three children sitting at home, not studying, and the whole family together, and all the tensions that come, and I'm also trying to do the work, work to bring bring food on the table, it is an incredible stress. As it was at that time in Egypt, where the stakes went higher. And so, I think what you're saying is that uh, one of the powerful ways of dealing with trauma is really becoming more embodied. Now, there's a whole art to this. There's a whole science to this. Because if I spent 30 years of my life, let's say, being disembodied, because from childhood I knew that going into the body will enliven all those experiences that I don't want, do not want to experience, I cannot just decide, okay, let me be embodied now. It has to be titrated in some way. So, uh, and at the same time, this is really the thing because one, one thing that is told about trauma is that you go to your head. You leave your body, you go to your head because the experience in the body is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So, so, that it, so that is exactly the right condition. It is about, it is about uh, embodiment. I will also say also 
<clears throat> you know, because the interpretation of the Jewish texts in this country, particularly, has been so influenced by the Germanic schools rather than by the Eastern European Hasidic schools. The, the interpretation became very literal and dry. And all the Jews who wanted to have a deep spiritual experience went to India, became Buddhists or, or, or Hindu or because nothing was available in our own tradition. I am a poster child uh, for that. I'm saying this, that as we learn more about what mysticism is about, then we come back, which is what happened to Alan Liu that we quoted. Mm -hmm. We come back to our tradition. We realize, holy what not, this has been here on the surface, lying, inviting us all along. And he was beaten out of us by those Protestant imitating Jews that came from Germany and wanted that to be wanted it to be respectable. So this is basically uh, uh, my take on why so many of the leaders of the the Jewish the Buddhist uh, the Buddhist movements in America were born in Brooklyn and speak with you know born in Brooklyn and and so many of the Hindu. Uh, uh, religions uh, leaders are Jewish. It's because there was a hunger that was not satisfied by us, and it's and part of it is that particular aspect of of neglecting the 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 uh, the neglecting the the um, the mystical aspect, uh, and not. There was good historical reasons for this, but I think now it's time to bring it all back. I agree. I could not agree with you more. <laughs> I could not agree more. Um, so I think one of the things I want to ask you to talk about also, um, I, I know that you, you, you know, you have a, um, well, I'll just ask you the question. So you have taught from the place of listening to a call that is deep within us. And I wondered if you could talk about that call. What is it? How do we listen for it? How do we find that sort of what you call the radical immediacy of the divine presence? How do, how do we, you know, obviously the, if we need to do trauma work, that's a place we need to go for sure. And to get professional help to help us deal with those things. Um, but also there, there might be, you know, some moments for us to be able to, to listen for what's right here. And so I, I wondered if you could talk about that a bit. Thank you. That, yeah, I appreciate the question. So when I teach and use the words radical immediacy of divine presence, I am playing records that were produced by the great mystics of all religions throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. So when the Quran says, Allah is closer to you than your juggler vein. When Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. When God tells Abraham, uh, God tells Moses, they will make me a sanctuary and I will live, I will dwell within them. It doesn't say they will make me a sanctuary and I will dwell within it. It says I will dwell within them and the Hasidic rabbis were very experienced to say within each and every one of them. And we can go on, we can go on. Uh, uh, the, the Islamic, the Upanishadic sages in India said, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Basically, they're saying that the movement of life itself is divine. And I love one of my favorite 
the favorite exclamation of that was by the Chernobyl Rebbe, the author of Maori Daim, who about 200 years ago said, I am alive. And who is this aliveness in me? Is it not the blessed creator? So the very fact that there is movement of life, of consciousness, it is not separate from that, from that. <laughs> you just say that. And I'd like to take it a little further and go to the teaching of a beautiful uh, master by the name of Pinchas of Kuritz. He's, he was a contemporary of the Baal Shem Tov, the, the founder of Hasidism. And he said, and he will need some explanation. He said, people think that they pray to the Holy Blessed One, but that is not so. Rather, prayer is divinity itself. Hmm. And you ask yourself, it almost like, like a Zen koan, what does it mean? Well, the first thing that it means is that prayer, according to him, is not mumbling some words that you read in a text. Definitely there's something else here that he refers to as prayer. And I cannot uh, uh, have the pretense that I understand, but I'll tell you my take on that. That what Pinchas of Kuritz says, that all the streams of life in the universe are a form of prayer that the manifestation, the life itself arises from the one and flows to the one. And so when a blade of grass grows, it prays. When an animal seeks to satiate its hunger or thirst, that's how prayer, the impulse of prayer manifests in it. When uh, an animal in heat, when an animal defends its territory, it is one more manifestation of that mystery and all this diversity in the Hasidic teaching is the levushim, the garments of that one. And all the movements of that one are basically prayer, God talking to himself. Mm. And in that sense, everything is prayer. So what do we do when we actually, if we are observant Jews and actually stand with the Siddur and pray three times a day, if we do that, or once a day, or once a week, or whatever, or once in, that's when we get with the program. We, we make it conscious. That's what life is about. Life is about all the streams of life. You know, there's this beautiful psalm in the, uh, it says, the heavens tell the glory of God and the firmament tells the, uh, speaks about the work of his hands. So it's, a, and, and, and telling the glory of God is prayer. So it tells us that the whole cosmos, the firmament is praying. It's one thing, and, and, and there's another thing in the, in the Psalms. It's a tefillah le'el chayai. Normally translated as praying to the God of my life. But literally, without any grammatic acrobatics, you see, it can also mean tefillah le'el chayai, means mm. my life is prayer to God. That's what it is. Mm. So from that point of view, and, it, and again, it's uh, in, in our better moments, we can hope to have a glimpse of that. And I would say that that is an invitation to completely realign who we understand ourselves to be, what we understand our life to be, and what we understand is that titanic war between the Pharaoh in us and the Moses in us, 
the Moses in us is a constant reminder and nagging invitation to come and make this a living reality in our life. Hmm. It's so interesting because when you say that, you know, this, you know, the tefillah chayai, you know, this, this idea feels to me that prayer as performative, you know, those moments when we, I wonder, I guess one of my questions is like how to, how to remove ourselves from if we are praying in a, you know, with Keva, where we have this structure that we're in the Sidor and we're in a particular time of day, not that we can't pray when we're on the way, but Derech is a wonderful way to pray. But the tools for, especially for those of us who are going to spend many hours either on Zoom, you know, on live stream, or for those of you who are coming in person to prayer for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we are, there's are so many words um, and how to use that. What are your tools for, um, I mean, I almost feel it's, you know, how do we bring life back into the Sidor? in a way that it seems to have, in some ways, you know, sometimes through the performative lost it. Mm. Maybe it didn't lose it, but maybe we lost it. It's, it's the $64,000 question, of course, <laughs> because, because it is really the, you're asking the, the most juicy question, how to make prayer real, how to make it so when I actually pray, I do have the consciousness that I now bear witness to the fundamental movement of life in the universe rather than my own kind of personal engagement. And they're so, and I would say katonti. Katonti means I'm really, you're asking me a huge question and, and that question uh, brings me almost not metaphorically to my knees, because how this is really the question of questions, the question of authenticity, the question of humility, the question of, 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 of the meaning of life. There is uh, what comes to mind, I'll just speak what comes to mind. Please. You know, when we, when, when we start the daily prayer, which we what those of us who observe and do three times a day, we start with the words, Adonai Svatai Tiftach Ufiegiti Ilatecha. God, open my mouth, open my lips so my mouth can speak your praise. We acknowledge that praying authentically Praying with depth, praying is in itself a divine grace. And Rabbi Elimelech from Lijansk, one of the greatest Hasidic uh, teachers that ever, ever arose, he, and he had prayer before prayer. So in all the old prayer books, you can still find that prayer before prayer of Rabbi Ali Melech von Lijansk. And if you read that prayer, basically he's saying, I realize this is really difficult. It's not out of disrespect for you. The whole, the whole I should say here, stop for a minute, asterisk. The whole thing of addressing God as you. What does it mean addressing God as you? If God is the totality of the universe, then is it some man in the sky? We, that's not where we look at. And yet, you address that as you because then you have a relationship to it. Once you have you, you can actually have a relationship. You can have, uh, uh, th there is a duality. Mm -hmm. So you can have a so he says, it's not that we don't respect you. It's not that we don't want to be, but basically he's saying in his words, in his terminology, 
but he's basically as in we're traumatized. Yeah. He's saying, help us out of this. And you see, you do need some divine grace. I want to say here, this is the collective thing is so important here. Because the, uh, the by the way, I hear put a shameless plug for a, a book that I really love. It's uh, called Healing Development, Healing Collective Trauma by Thomas Hubel, which discusses uh, exactly this, what I want to say, that uh, uh, there is a collective dimension to it that makes it difficult for our people of our time to really uh, especially if we're sophisticated intellectually and philosophically, to really get to that position of surrender. Yeah. We think, we, we, uh, we almost feel apologetic within ourselves about it. Yeah. And, and, and I think two things really helpful. One is meditation, that you get a glimpse of what it is to just basically... Uh, just the occasional glimpse of an existential relief and slowing down, very important and helps with embodiment. And prayer itself, prayer develops through prayer. So, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I know that this is no magic tricks. I don't have magic bullets. I'm, I'm leaning into this myself and struggling with it myself but this is kind of like sharing I love heart. it I love what you say I you know I was thinking this morning as I was preparing for tonight um I was thinking about um you know the when we were when you and I I, I you well, you mentioned the Thomas Hubble book to me and I I bought it and I read it because it is amazing. It's an amazing book. So thank you for that recommendation. And I recommend it three times over. Um, but I was thinking about the embodiment that we have all, many of us have missed over these past, this past year and a half of the embodiment of communal song and the idea of being able to get lost in the collective and I, you know, if folks out there, you know, those of you who are in DC, uh, you know, Addis has outdoor, this is like my own plug, but, you know, we have outdoor uh, tent in the front and in the back. So we're going to have outdoor services. Um, we'll have indoor too, but I do think that whether that's like a, a song group or a, some kind of collective prayer that people can do together where you you know, we can almost lose ourselves, you know, the boundaries and the borders disappear between us and the people we are with. Um, I think that that has been something that we've missed so much over these past 12 months and the or 18 months. Um, and the idea of being able to come back together in the collective has the potential to, to maybe also offer, um, you know, the, the spontaneity and the organic nature of what happens to the emotional space of each one of us in that prayer, because uh, we're not alone. So let me throw something speculative here. Because, you know, uh, we said that there are emergent things happening sometimes out of pressure and out of calamities. And this is something, I'm not the first to speculate this, but I'm gonna throw it out there. We spent so much time in Zoom. And to me, I do all my therapy work in Zoom. And we have become more skilled if we're listening to attune to each other even if we're, I'm not saying that coming together is not gazillion times better. I miss hugs. I miss uh, touch. I miss like, like eating together and, and all those things, of course. And yet we are actually coming into a situation where 
look, I'm right now, I'm not looking at you. I'm sitting in my room. There's a piece of glass in front of me made in China. And somehow there is a, some representations of you, pixelated representations of you, which is not totally clear. I think if I saw you now in DC in person, I would recognize you, but still. And yet there's so much that we exchange. There's so much depth that can be exchanged. There's so much emotion, that comes, so much inspiration that can be exchanged. I think that gives us a kind of a hint at a direction that we can move into in terms of a, a deeper levels of attunement that even when we are together, mm. we will learn to be more attuned to each other. And that's a kind of a, it's not that this is a solace or a silver lining we're seeing, but that is something that I feel is happening because also without Zoom, where would we be now? I mean, I mean thank Zoom God. Made that, yeah, <laughs> Zoom made that whole thing gazillion times better. So, yeah. So right. Um, I want to give everybody here a chance to ask you questions. Um, we're going to ask you all to um, put them in the chat and our amazing Naomi will um, feed them to us uh, so that I can ask Igal um, these questions that you all have. So feel free to do that. Um, I do want to, as, as you're writing in your questions, um, Igal, just about what you just said about becoming so much more attuned, you know, in this when both not having what we always had and then also this, what we're doing on this Zoom as learning how to communicate with each other in different ways. Um, I'll just share with everybody that the first time we, we as clergy went back to the synagogue, um, first individually, we were leading prayers alone in the synagogue um, through the live stream for folks that were following on the live stream. And then um, as it became clear that it was okay for us to be together, masked and very, very distant from each other with filters and all kinds of things, we started going two by two and then three by three and then four by four into the synagogue. And the first time that we heard each other say amen mm. to our prayer, we we, st I mean, our, we stopped, we, we stopped mid service because it was so overwhelming to hear somebody else say amen to our prayers and to say the line, Yehesh Me Rabba, which is a line we have omitted from our Kaddishes that we do. We've been doing Kaddish online, but omitting that line without a physical minion. And it was like, as you said, like the attunement of you know, I've heard a man a million times, you know, in my prayer life and in my life as a rabbi and a prayer leader. And that moment of hearing it has inculcated it in a very different way of what I'm saying and what's being said to me when someone says a man, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with you. I hear you. I'm here. I'm a witness to you, which was a way I never I never experienced it that way before. And I think it's so what you just said about, um, about this attunement, you know, that we have had to do in such a different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Naomi, whenever you're ready, you can feed us those. Um, and, um, and if folks are having trouble, you can also feel free to put them in the chat and we'll see them too in the chat. Um, so I don't see any in the chat and I don't see any hands up. Um, so I'm going to jump in with a question of my own. <laughs> um, Igal, when you and I talked, um, we talked about an interpretation and a reinterpretation of these concepts from the Torah of Tameh and Tahor. And they've been translated as pure and impure, or rather impure and pure. Um, and we talked about um, maybe looking at them um, as um, another way of thinking about being dissociated or being disembodied versus being centered and being um, attuned. 
And um, when we look in our, our ritual life at what some of the, um, the mechanisms are for going from being um, scattered to being centered and focused, I think Judaism has actually like some really beautiful um, ways of transitioning between those two states. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So sorry, that was not a question, but um, what you were talking about before in terms of the, um, the trauma being the dissociation and then um, our natural state is, is to be more attuned and aligned. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to say a little bit more about that while other people are writing their comments and questions. And yeah, thank you. So I learned about trauma for the first time some years back from, from the author of this book that I told you about uh, healing uh, collective trauma, uh, a spiritual teacher by the name of Thomas Hubel. And for him, trauma healing is part of spiritual development or alignment. In other words, uh, a lot of us, a lot of me included, a lot of uh, people who are, uh, who are serious spiritual seekers who devoted a lot of time to that, we wanted to just go for the highest truth uh reach for the highest truth and hoping to bypass all the psychological trauma work on the way hmm. and judaism tells you that's not possible there is a, a beautiful inter i mentioned rabbi elimelech of lijansk and he has a beautiful interpretation of the burning bush story you know, the burning bush, Moses sees this amazing sight of the, the huge flame rising up. And the bush that's burning is not consumed. It's a dry bush in the desert should be consumed in seconds. And so uh, the Hasids, they always interpret everything psychologically. And they said, this, this flame is the flame that the mystic or the tzaddik experiences when he, it's always, in those days it was always a he, but uh, I apologize, when he experiences this one oneness with God, then that, that flame, you know, is just of mystical union with God is there. And he feels that flame should burn all my evil inclinations. After I feel this complete union with the, with, the, with the Almighty, I should be purified. And then he realized the bush is not consumed. Mm. And the bush is all my evil inclinations. Mm. That work is mine. I need to take care of that. Those quote-unquote evil inclination, again, in the words of today, I would say they are my trauma-based tendencies. I need to take care of them. I need to work about morality, about my morality. I need to take care of my psychological uh, bugs in the system. That's my work. So uh, I feel that there is a message here and, and we know so many people, especially in the 20s and 21st century, we've seen so many spiritual teachers who were very gifted spiritually and had a very, uh, very powerful experiences and not just powerful experiences themselves, they were gifted with the ability to transmit those experiences to others. And they were turned out to be, they were terrible human beings. They, they, they did a lot of things that created a lot of disillusion in the hearts and the minds of sincere spiritual seekers. So, we see that we need we need both and and judaism asks us to do both not only judaism i just should say this is not unique to our tradition uh what i would like to say is that uh what we know about trauma work today we did not know in the past 
in the past, a lot of it was basically, uh, there was all kinds of mystical formulas that you should do. But what we do know today, for example, I know that you're in charge of the mikveh. The mikveh is, to those of those know, this is the ritual bath. And the ritual bath is you're supposed to, uh, to build it in a particular way and to use this kind of water or that kind of water. And, and you go and you dip in there and then you're supposed to be purified. But again, that's a metaphor. That's a metaphor of how you reach that part of yourself that was never impure, how you reach that part of your own consciousness that was never solid, that part that was never tame. And when you reach that purity within yourself, then you feel that those impurities dissolve. And you need to do the work to make sure they really, it's not just you feel they dissolve, they really do. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. <laughs> <laughs> There's a beautiful question from Anna who says, um, how can we humans address the trauma carried in the body of the earth aside from clearing physical remedies like reducing carbon in the atmosphere? That's, that's yeah, it's a brilliant question. And, 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 and I think all spiritual traditions now are, are called to, to address this. And, uh, and I think the answer is what I touched upon before is my relationship to the earth. Am I on the earth or am I one with the earth? Am I a rider on this rock or am I part of this whole thing? If I'm part, it's just like being embodied. It's another extension of being embodied. And this is not just this uh, intellectual. First of all, I have to see, actually, most of the time, I don't feel part of this earth. In my better moments, I do. So then I have to ask myself, so what happens in those better moments? that allows it to do more of it. Because I and everybody else needs to learn how to experience ourselves. You, you see, if, if this hand, I will not cut it because it'll hurt me, it's part of my hand. I will protect it. The same with the earth. If it's part of me, I will not violate it part of our collective individual and collective trauma is we feel separate from the earth. We feel separate from our body. And then by extension, we also feel separate from the earth. So the challenge is how do we work to actually actualize our oneness with the earth? That's I think the challenge of our time. Such an important challenge also for those of us who live in cities, you know, I mean, the earth is av available to us, but it, you know, the, and, and here, right, Central Park or for us in DC, you know, Rock Creek Park and as we go out our doors, but I, I do think there's a lot of concrete and um, finding ways of us really feeling, as you said, the embodiment of what it means to be a part of, of the earth. It's, it's so important. I okay. want to say one more, one more yeah. quick thing about that with your permission. There's a Hebrew word teva. It means nature. And in Hebrew, every letter has a numerical value. So every word has a numerical value because you add the numerical values of the letters. And the Hasids point out that the numerical value of the word teva, which means nature, is the same as the numerical value of the word Elohim, which means God the name of God. So means, is there a way that I can relate to nature with the same reverence that I have towards God? Because as they say, God hides itself in nature. Hmm. Beautiful. 
Okay, there are two more questions and I think we should really get to both. And then we wanted to end with a meditation. So we're gonna- we're gonna a short do, meditation. Yes. Right, a short meditation. Um, so Wendy writes, isn't some of our trauma and disconnection from our recent ancestors and histories? For me, connection with history and ancestors feels similarly powerful to connection with nature for feeling my inner Moses. But for most of my life, I haven't known that. Even watching B'nai Mitzvah of people on Zoom who I don't know is very powerful for me. That is uh, beautiful, Wendy. And you see, if you think of the history of Jews in this country, many of them came here and out of the trauma that they have experienced in Eastern Europe, they wanted no connection to their, to their ancient histories. They often changed their names. Often they raised their children without them knowing that they're, uh, that they're Jewish. <laughs> the uh, one person uh, who's here now, I will not mention her name. She's now a student, a rabbinical student. And she didn't know until I think her late teenage years or something like that, that she actually comes from a Jewish family. So, and their, her parents probably thought like many other parents, who needs to give her the trouble? What's the advantage of being Jewish? It just got us into, got, got us into trouble after trouble. So the intention was, was, was positive, but uh, de facto, we cut ourselves from our roots which is the same movement as cutting ourselves from our body, the same movement as cutting ourselves from the collective un unconscious and the mythology. It's all part of the same trauma-informed movement. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, maybe I should say, <laughs> this is my... So when you experience that, you experience reawakening of that desire, this in my to the extent that I can be an interpreter here, this is a very healthy invitation to connect to your roots. And, and, and it sounds like a very good thing to me. Yeah, and it's a coming home. I mean, yeah. I always feel that way. It's like our, you know, it, it, we're coming home to something that has been, I think of it as like a light that has been there, but we couldn't have access to it. And something in there keeps, you know, burning our mikdash ma'at, you know, and, um, and the altar is in there burning and waiting mm -hmm. for to be connected to something, you know, outside of ourselves. Um, and I love that the Zoom B'nai Mitzvah are powerful. I, I think that's so special. Um, okay, and our last question is from Betsy, um, who asks great questions. And here's one. Could you please say a few sentences that include the following words? Teshuva, attunement, uh, sorry, attunement, and purity. Mm -hmm. ah. So teshuva, for those who don't know, means return. And the return that we're talking about is return to a state of alignment, a state of in which Moses is superior, a state in which the Moses in us wins. And uh, today, uh, too often, shuva is used in the sense of repent. Repent. And I remember Leonard Cohen's song, when they say repent, 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 I wonder what they meant. And you wonder, what, what do you mean? But if teshuvah means realign with your depth, that's something I can uh, sink my teeth into. And then that's attunement also, is very deeply connected to that. Teshuvah is all about attunement, as I said. It is attunement to that part of us, which is Moses. And purity... <laughs> Purity comes out of that, that attunement, I would say. Yeah. I hope that satisfies. It's kind of like, I feel like uh, 
Uh, it's almost like a, a high school sort of uh, test question and write a composition, uh, including these sentences. But there's beautiful, beautiful sentences to, to contemplate. Thank you very much. So, Igal, I'm going to hand it to you to lead us in a short meditation, and then I'll close us out um, after we've had an opportunity to, to realign. Mm -hmm. So, rather than call it meditation, let's call it a, a, an exercise of alignment. And if you feel comfortable, sit. Uh, on a chair, on a sofa, reasonably with a straight back, not like a soldier, but just comfortable. And notice your exhalation. Don't mind your thoughts or sensations, they're more just very lightly have your awareness float over your exhalation. And with every exhale, you can as if sink more deeply into your body. So you exhale, and it's as if there is a relaxation into the bodily sensations. And if you wish, you could even slow your exhalation a tad. Just a little bit. And if your mind wanders, don't resist it. Let the thoughts be there. And just gently bring your awareness back to your slow exhalation without pushing thoughts away.
Now bring your awareness to your feet. Feel your feet touching the ground. Feel the weight of your body on the chair or the sofa you're sitting on. Take a deep breath. You could even wiggle your toes or fingers a little bit and come back. I want to thank you, Egal, for tonight, for your wisdom, for everything you've given us. Um, such a beautiful pathway where we are right now and God willing, where we will be in a few weeks entering this new year. And um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I want to thank Naomi Malka for handling our Zoom and our back end and um, and I want to invite all of you to um, all of the offerings that we are um, offering at Addis, whether that's the chot on Saturday night, we have a tent in the tent or online. Um, we have many offerings through our Jewish Mindfulness Center that you can find on our website, as well as Briut, which is our wellness center. You are all invited to anything and everything. Um, and we warmly welcome you and um, just lots of gratitude, Igal, and wishing everybody a Shana Tova Matuka, a sweet and good and healthy new year. Thank you very much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Good night, everybody.